What is blackness? Is it a state of mind or a state of being? Do you love your blackness or is it just a fleeting feeling? Do you stand proudly in your blackness or are you quietly black, not trying to intimidate or shine too bright? Self-imposed flatness. What is black culture? Can you identify or have you recused yourself? If so, why? Can you appreciate the beauty and uniqueness of black culture or do you disassociate, denounce and deny? Do you refrain from the culture because of public opinion or due to self-imposed cultural discrimination, a process of elimination? The whole world covets and appropriates Black culture because our swag is undeniable. Simply said, we are not perfect, but we are the shit. Our people are so godly and spiritually lit. Instead of practicing indifference, make a difference. Push the culture forward instead of peddling conformed difference. Are you in this to win this with us? Then claim it. Take accountability. Push the culture forward. Are you setting a good example? Are you doing the work within and without? Or just focusing on yourself while pushing northward? When you disassociate by turning a blind eye on the degradation of your own culture, you leave yourself and your people open for total disintegration. And without the people, can we, you and me, really move forward? Do you really want to take that chance? Do you really want to avoid taking a stance? What does that future look like? At first glance. Inaction may seem harmless. You're just distancing from the group. But when you just focus on yourself instead of pushing the culture forward by exuding Black pride and personifying Black excellence, you may find success. But like Kanye said, then you'll always just be a nigger in a coop. No social advance. Is this how low you're willing to stoop? Welcome. To Melanated Conversations. Our narrative and our perspective. Here on the podcast, we are amplifying the voices of Black women and sharing their powerful stories of transformation. I'm Tyrion. And I'm Yana. Let's start the show. Welcome, welcome back to another episode of Melanated Conversations. I am your co-host, Yana. And I am your co-host, Tarian. And you guys, welcome back to our lovely reoccurring guest this season, Ms. Sophia Lenore. Say hi to the people, Sophia. Hello, 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 everyone. Sophia. So yeah, if y'all haven't caught them, we in yet, you know, when you get three of us behind the mic, we're in for a good time. We are bringing another just <laughs> side conversation. I don't know what we're going to call this, this segment um, of our show because things can get, these are more of our deeper talks, our deeper conversations and just candid things that we may feel in the moment or just want to discuss with amongst girlfriends. So you will be, just know you'll be in for a treat when you hear more of these as we continue to have these um, segments for you guys and for your blue viewing pleasure because now we are coming to you live in action and video you can see not only you can not only hear the foolery behind the scenes but you can see it too look we're giving you value today um so <laughs> i even put on put a little volume gel my edge down for y'all so yeah we are here thank you ladies for making the time today to have this conversation but before we actually go into that how can i forget i almost forgot here you know why you just tap me on the shoulder virtually because we're not in the same room i don't care what texas governor said we still staying six feet away we still virtually still masking up so 
Because I'm going to tell you, you roll up on me and you have a mask, you get bop, bop, one, two, real quick, real quick, real quick. So don't even come away with that type of energy. Yes, right. Sorry, y'all. When we just, y'all don't know, me and Tex, me and Tyrion reside in Texas. And if y'all have been keeping up with latest news with Texas, y'all know why we feel the way we feel. We're a little teasing right now. But we're not bringing that energy to the show. It's all fun and love today. And of course, we always like to show, kick off our show with a little fun, a little game of one gotta go. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna do things a little differently. We are now in the month of March. It is actually when is International Month. Yes. So we're gonna we're gonna you know take y'all down memory lane, but we're gonna put a little twist on it for Women's International Month. So let's talk a little women's history, but we're gonna play one gotta go. Okay. All right. I'm going to name off four inventions that Black women brought to the forefront, okay? Pioneered. And then you have to pick which one you would eliminate. Y'all already know, forever. You have to eliminate this one invention forever. All right? And I'm going to give credit to the to these women who have pioneered these inventions. Y'all ready? I don't know. You had me until you said, going to have to go forever, but... Stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. <laughs> <laughs> Bring on your question. All right. First one. All right. Caller ID, who was actually invented by Dr. Shirley Jackson. Okay. Wow. So she implemented that device that we all love and appreciate on our telephones because sometimes oh, Dr. Shirley Jackson. Okay. <laughs> the heater, which is like the floor heater. It's like she reinvented the heating and cooling that people use on those little heaters. Alice H. Parker, okay? We could have used that heater, that heat a couple of weeks ago here in Texas, but no shade. (laughs) The menstrual pad belt and also the toilet roll holder, Mary Beatrice Davidson Kenner. She had a long name, but (laughs) for the people, okay? So the menstrual pad and the toilet hold, the toilet roll holder. And then, you know, because Black women and our hair are synonymous. So the infamous Madam C.J. Walker, who helped to pave the way for Black hair care. So which one, which one has to go? Call ID, heating, our menstrual pad situation or black hair care who, who, what y'all getting rid of which one anybody <laughs> <laughs> oh man oh man oh man i would say call id only because i don't think anybody uses the home phone anymore <laughs> no but on your cell phone cell phone is she came up with the idea of the concept behind it so I would think was that was that was that Dr. Shirley? That was Dr. Shirley. I'm here for Dr. Shirley because she, yeah. she she invented the who is this on my who is who this is? new she phone the screener <laughs> the, the phone screener. I, I appreciate Dr. Shirley. I need to know if it's somebody I ain't trying to talk to. Right. <laughs> oh, I See, you. I thought I thought when you said call ID, I thought that meant like only for the home phone. Not for the cell phone that's system, yeah. but I think it's infiltrated into you being able to know who it is that's mm-hmm. calling you to recognize, oh, this number is calling. So. Okay, so I don't like to be cold and I definitely need feminine hygiene. So I'm going to stick with <laughs> fair <enough>. cold ID. <laughs> no, fair answer. Fair <laughs> answer. Y'all? Oh, man. I need to know who calling me. <laughs> I need my agent lane. What were the other ones? Oh, okay. Ooh, women and get yeah, I need you. Uh, yeah. Well, we just think of everything. We're just so excellent, y'all. I don't know. Ooh. <laughs> oh, what was the Tough. other one? Tough. Yeah. Uh, black hair care menstrual pads. The heater. Oh, you know, we stay cold. We use some cold people. I mean, no, we're, not cold. we're not cold people, but we're cold. We're naturally cold. Because we, Terry and I talk about this all the time. You know, you trace, I really feel like, you know, we are sub-Saharian African descendants. 
we ain't meant for the cold environment. So I need now keep my heater. That's number one. I need my heat. I have a flashback to two weeks ago. I need my heat. Oh, hard. It hurts me. Oh, I don't know. This is this is the one that I really have been stumped on. Wow. I'm gonna have to end a meeting. I guess it's either gonna have to be call ID for me too, or dare I say here? I don't know. I know. That's oh, why I didn't want to say that because how y'all looked at me. But I was like, no, nah, I don't know. I don't know. This is a no judgment zone, but yes. also I'm judging you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Madam CJ, it wasn't just relaxing, right? It was like the no. whole gamut. Okay, that, that changes right. things then. Because I was trying to go to modern day me. Like, I don't use no relaxer right now. So right. I can go to the side. But even her legacy, you know, oh my God. It's, I guess I'm having to throw out my phone. Wait, wait, wait. Dr. Shirley. I, no, Dr. Shirley, I love you, Dr. Shirley. I really do. <laughs> no, I, I, so call ID's got to go for you? Um, for the sake of this question, yes. I, re- I feel like this is being taken from my life for real. So I'm really, my heart is dropped. Like, don't <laughs> but don't take the call ID. Um, okay, okay, that's two for caller ID. I sitting here listening to both of you all like go in circles, just doing the process of elimination. I was like, no, nah, but for real, this is really a hard decision to make because all four of these products or entities are extremely essential. Not only to black people, but just people in general, but also very essential for me. Cause I, for one, I love me some call ID. Cause I'm just, <laughs> I ain't gonna hold you. I don't know you. I don't know your number. I was not necessarily expecting your phone call. You may not hear from me. I'm not picking up my phone. I ain't gonna hold. So God bless Dr. Shirley. Same thing. Yana and I are one and the same when it comes to heat. It runs in our blood, j- literally. Literally, I am cold right now. I am covered up. (laughs) (laughs) I am cold. I have a blanket covering my legs right now. And, you know, God bless Mary Beatrice Davidson Kenner with her long name. But sis was out here doing the dang thing for us, making sure we were, you know, we had something to keep us together during that time of the month. So I can't, I'm not upset with her about that. Either. No, Sister Bernice was a pioneer opening up the spring door and checking to see how cold it was. No, nah, mm-hmm, right. right there. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> Man. Um, and of course, hair care, whether you're natural or not or whatever, hair care is essential to every Black woman. It's extremely important. And just the groundbreaking movement that she had with setting up her business is, you know, for the ages. So I'm going to actually have to go with call ID as well, because it is probably the least essential thing. Yes, it's convenient. Yes, it's, it's not a lie. The only reason why. Yes. If I could keep everything <laughs> on the list, I would. But since we have to eliminate something, that's what it would, would have to be. <laughs> it's three for call ID, y'all. Y'all let us know <laughs> in the comment section down below which one you would eliminate. We want to hear from y'all. But yeah, like we said, it's March. Happy International Women's Month. And shout out to all these great pioneers, Black women who made sure that they were groundbreaking and provided things that we use today and are essential to our life livelihood. So yes, thank y'all. On to the next one. That was a good one. And I know there's a probably a whole list of names that contribute to society that people don't even know and recognize that absolutely that was, that was done by a black woman but we're gonna put y'all on game before end of the day y'all gonna hear more of these so wow. thank you ladies for playing thank you for the question terry and that was a good one that was a good sure. one keep them but don't keep, keep, them, keep them coming oh, my hand up. but don't make them so hard <laughs> what'd you say sophia Sorry, I said that was an easy one for me because I don't mind hanging up on people. I don't need to know who you are. I, I when I when I pick up the phone and if you someone I deem I don't want to speak to, I got no problem hanging up on you. Excuse me, what are you what are you calling me for? Click, 
Uh, I'm not shy. I'm one of those people. That, I'm one of those people who can live in a part. I can live in a house without a peephole, even like that. Like I, I don't need to have a heads up. I'm not shy. I'm really comfortable with telling people to go jump off, jump on, jump in a lake or stop Maybe calling me. Problem. I'm really easy with that. I don't need call ID. Sometimes I, sometimes the call ID might deter me from telling you what I need to tell you. So you know what? Let me pick up this phone. Let me tell her real quick. <laughs> That's my problem right there. I have a hard time because I can go left real quick. And so I'd be like trying to keep some peace. So my whole thing about you ding-donging and calling unexpectedly. Don't show up at my doorstep and you ain't telling me he's coming to my house. Leave it on yeah, the Case in point, and then I promise we'll get to our conversation, guys, is I was supposed to get some Girl Scout cookies from Terry's house from her girl. And we happened to be in her area. And because I know I was just in the area, but I didn't make it aware that I was going to stop by in advance. I texted her and I called her to see if it was okay if I come by to grab the items. And when I didn't get her text back or call back, I was like, I'm not showing up. I'm not going. And <laughs> and this is family. And Terry's like, you know, you could have just showed up at my door. And I was like, nope, I know the rule. If you that applies to family just as well as other people. Like, if I don't know you're showing up to my door, don't come to my door. And I, and I was like, I'm not going to her door. I don't care if I am literally two houses down, not just in the area. No, I will come back. I'll make a trip back. But I mean, oh, just- <laughs> I appreciate that. And and when I dropped them off at your house and you're like, why are you didn't call? And I was like, I was just trying to hit you with Amazon. I wasn't trying to be in your business or nothing. I want to drop off the, the product and be on my way. I ain't going to bother y'all. I sent you the picture. It's on your doorstep. Thank you for your service. <laughs> Oh, it's so true. Yeah. Text before you call and text before you um, over. Yeah. Or call before you show up either or. Yeah. Yes. That, that has been your public service announcement by the Lady Conversations and Person. So, going into our conversation today, guys. Now, this topic, just want to let you know, boom, 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 trigger warning. It may be, we may get a little deep today. So, I'm going to need y'all to put your big girl and big boy pants on today and just. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, listen and listen with attention with the words that we say, as well as, you know, take it for what it's worth. These are our, these are our opinions, our own, these are our words, our thoughts. So we're just going to have a, a girl conversation around, it's more culture related. So Terry Ann and I and Sophia, we've been, you know, having a lot of different like side chats a lot. And some of our conversations get real deep. At times we're like, man, we should have recorded this. And then sometimes we're like, I don't know if the world is ready for these kind of conversations. But when you think about it, when we say those things, sometimes it's like, if we say this, then maybe it's exactly what the world needs is because we're all so used to watering down or trying to build up to a place to where we're comfortable and speaking and talking about topics that are topics that need to be talked about or chatted through. And within that, it's not to say that we will all agree. We all have, we're all individuals. So that means we all have our own individual interpretations. And that's actually what I feel is what constitutes a healthy discussion when you can come to a conversation collectively as an individual with your own contributions to the topic at hand. So I know that was a long winded way of saying that our conversation is going to be a little deeper. And we want you to, we want to set this expectation going forward, especially not all of our conversations are going to be so heated and heavy. I'm not saying that today will be heated and heavy, but I just want to level set the expectation that sometimes we got to have the hard conversations. We got to sit each other down and really just talk things out in order for true change to happen. So today we want to kind of talk about moving our culture forward. And I know that's very broad and the conversation may kind of teeter a little bit outside the bounds, but what I say about moving the culture forward, my interpretation more so is what are, how do we define that? What direction do we see ourselves moving as a collective to really truly move ourselves forward? And even how do we as individuals contribute to what we deem as moving ourselves forward as a culture. So I want to open up the conversation to both the ladies, Terry, 
Sophia, kind of, can we start by talking about what is our own individual interpretation of moving our culture forward? You want to take this? Do you want to start, Terry? No, you go ahead. Oh, gosh. Okay, from from my perspective, and I'm going to keep it based on my perspective because everyone has their own, what would be considered moving the culture forward would be having first to do with yourself in terms of how you are carrying yourself as a person of color, in terms of not falling into stereotypes and character branding that has been established by other people, not by us, in terms of how we conduct ourselves, what we're capable of, what we're not capable of. Just making sure you're, you're, you're living your life outside of those stereotypes and outside of those external brandings, you know, so that you are being a, a, a good example of someone within your community and being a good example of someone in your community that is watched by the younger generations that are taking heed to what you're doing, how you're conducting yourself and how you express your pride as a person of color. So first being able to exude certain qualities that are upstanding and that are perpetuating of, of pride, that should be first and foremost. Secondly, is then how you treat others who look like you and making sure that you are being a, a, a patron to Black businesses, Black business owners, and also making sure that you're perpetuating um, certain behavior towards people who look like you that is respectful in terms of how you treat your women, respectful in terms of how you treat your elders, and respectful in terms of how you just generally conduct yourself and how you interact with people who look like you instead of, you know, fighting and bickering and and, and engaging in the crabs in the barrel syndrome, being more loving and uplifting and supportive and, 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 and encouraging. You know, I just feel like first what you do within and then what you do without is really important for pushing the culture forward first and foremost. But that's from, from my point of view. Yeah, I think that actually that does the, a great, very great, good point. And I don't want to, we're talking about our culture, culture, black culture. So I don't want to give too much attention to everybody else. I'm going to hold you. That's, that's not what this conversation is about. But I do want to preface preface, or, or kind of lead into the idea, kind of what Sophia was saying is like, when we talk about having our own standards and how we, how we do life, how we treat one another, how we treat, you know, our elders and our women and all those different things and not having that crab in a barrel mentality, we have to eliminate, we've got to learn collectively how to eliminate the quote unquote, the, the white standard, because at the end of the day, we've all been programmed, I think, to a certain degree to be like, this is the standard that you have to live up to and attain. And unfortunately, we know that standard is not of African descent. It is Eurocentric through and through, right? And so we've got to learn how to deprogram and deconstruct our thinking and really get back to the basics of our history and our roots and finding that gold standard for us. I think that's the first thing, because at the, at the end of the day, the white man standard is never meant to benefit us in any way. So if we can first recognize that, I think that's a step in the right direction. Then I'm going to go all the way back on the other end. Now, the other end of that is, which I know, I think we're all going to kind of jump into that. So hopefully I'm not jumping the gun too much. But on the other backhand of that is also the big A word, accountability and holding ourselves accountable in every aspect in every organization, in every institution that we are involved in, we have to make sure that we are holding ourselves accountable, our leaders accountable, and those in it within just our sphere of influence. We have to hold individuals accountable for the things that they do and the things that they say, and sometimes the things that they don't say. And so I think just the overall blanket statement to answer your initial question, Yana, that's my perspective and my, my thought on that. No, both, no, I, I appreciate that. And both of you actually touched a lot of points that I was actually going to address to you. And basically, I just, I just basically summarized it to you. Number one is truly deprogramming 
ourselves from what and how we were taught to be and show up in the world is number one. Number two is educating ourselves. So, and not just, again, the programming space of education, but truly educating ourselves, like you said, on our culture, on our, just anything that helps us move forward intellectually, socially, professionally, just how we move and bang together. Three, like you said, accountability. I, I coupled that with action because a lot of things that we we can, and I, and I for one will say this for myself, we can complain about the things that are not, but what are we doing? What actions are we taking? Like how, what step, what literal steps are we doing to address, even if it's a small thing within our own community, like sitting down and sitting on our, sitting on our hands, but just using our mouthpieces is not long, is no longer enough to move us forward. It has to be driven by true action that is coupled, that is grounded and foundational in education and truly removing the standard of programming. Yeah, no, I, I, that's, yeah, especially that last part about action. It's so crazy because I, over, I thought about it so many times in my mind. I was like, how long do we do we sit in this space of kind of the call out culture? Or, or of course, we bring things to light. And we shed light on things. And they say, this is the problem. This is the problem. This is the problem. This is the problem. But the problem's not being solved. And us sitting on our hands and being like, this is the problem. This is the problem. But we're not doing anything to help solve the problem. And it made me think literally of a conversation I was having with my seven-year-old yesterday. And we were talking about the, some of the stuff that that's been transpiring here in Texas. And we were talking about, I think the, the ice storm or not, there was no ice storm, girl, whole blizzard. It was a whole situation anyway, but that whole debacle that happened a few weeks ago. And I was like, you know, there are people that still don't have water and Da, da 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 and all this other stuff and people that can't fix food you know just all this other stuff and she said something so simple she goes so why don't we just go to wherever they are and give them food and I was like yeah I was like that's a good idea she was like so no like why don't we right now like go <laughs> pack up resources that we have and go take it to the people and I was so convicted in that moment because I was like that dog get a seven-year-old what we doing around here but she was speaking truth and sometimes it's just that simple to not always be like yes this is the problem but now let's put our get up off our tails put one foot in front of the other and make sure that we are taking care of our own at the end of the day because we see clearly the people that we put in office well I ain't gonna say I put him in office but the people that have been put in office are not doing their jobs Right. And we can't and we clearly cannot rely on those individuals. So that's yeah. Go ahead, somebody else. <laughs> yeah, I mean, basically what I think you're saying is you're kind of well, the seven year old kind of just spoke in a reference to the Black Panther mentality. Let's stop looking to government and let's take care of our own. I mean, that's how the free breakfast program started. Instead of complaining that it wasn't enough aid available, they just decided to just buy buildings and they were feeding over a thousand children a week just in Illinois, you know? So their whole philosophy was, we're not going to look to the police to protect us. We're going to police ourselves. We're not going to look to the government to help us and support us during times of need or times of natural disaster. For example, in Texas, we're going to help ourselves. That was, I feel certain, certain ideology, I, ideal, excuse me, has, have been choked out of us like breath. Cause we used to have, this was our mentality as people of color to basically take care of ourselves and manage. I mean, look at Black Wall Street. We didn't need anybody to help us. We literally came together and had all these businesses, banks, um, hospitals, everything, all self-contained. It's in us to do it. Unfortunately, each time we've done it, we've had to face powers that be that don't want us to have this level of independence. 
and level of independent thought and have this self-reliance. So we know how to do it. We know what to do. It's just that we have to continue to do so against the powers that be. I'm not going to I'm not going to name the F, I'm not going to name the alf, the alphabet gang, but that alphabet gang is always coming in and infiltrating our leaders, infiltrating our our resources, our programs, yeah. because they don't want us to be self sufficient. Mm-hmm. How do you get rid of that first? Because again, Terry, and you go out there and you do this, the alphabet gang might be after you again. <laughs> you know. Like they built, they burnt down the the building of the Panthers. And that was literally just the building holding food for children. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how many people have seen Judas and the Black Messiah, but it's a common thread. Oh, absolutely. And another common thread that I picked up on, which I don't want to go down the rabbit hole, but when we start talking about these leaders who end up being taken out by these, a lot of times when their rhetoric changed from even a pro-Black movement, but to the people's movement or poor people's campaigning, that's when, because then it's not just, oh, this particular sect of people, but then you've got a massive amount of other people from other backgrounds who essentially, they got nothing to lose. They have nothing to lose. And by any means necessary, they will do what they have to do to take the power back into their hands. And them boys didn't like that. They ain't like that. So when our leaders' rhetoric even started to shift, even in that paradigm, then they became even more of a threat. But like I said, I don't want to go into necessarily that direction because we're talking about black people once again but that was something that I I just recently that I've been looking up and noticing that was a trend when the rhetoric changed in that perspective so yeah well I agree with you 100 that's all I want to say no that's definitely I think even more of a trigger point too when it comes to moving the culture forward because like, I didn't want to give that perception that a lot of us sit on our hands just to sit on our hands. Now, that is true in some forms. There are a lot of people that make, that are noise makers, right? change makers. There's a difference. Absolutely. Uh, but there are truly some people that are really out there really trying to change and make things happen. But like you said, there isn't, they're being pushed out or pushed away or muted or like you said, taken straight out. Yeah. So how do we, as a collective, get back to that space even Black Panther, if you want to get back to Black Black Panther mentality, how do we collectively do that? With, and, First of all, we need to protect each other. I mean, nobody gonna step, nobody else is gonna step up and sit on that throne until we've learned how to protect our leaders. Hmm. Like, I, like I was saying about common thread. I mean, I'm not sure people seen, you know, uh, United States against Billy Holiday. Alphabet gang, same leader of that alphabet gang, mm-hmm. same leader of that alphabet gang, Judas and the Black Messiah, mm-hmm. okay, Malcolm X, mm-hmm. Martin Luther King. Mm-hmm. Can I pause oh, you right there just for a second? the alphabet gang. <laughs> <laughs> hold that thought, hold that thought, because I want to address something right there, because you made a very valid point, and again, it goes to do you think they're allowing these type of films that show these great leaders that have made these movements and con- contributions to society and then show their downfall that they have come in and infiltrated and brought us down as a way to deter us? Yes. It's a hidden agenda behind that to get to the masses to show us like, okay, try us if you want to. You see what happened to the ones yeah. that you thought were at the top of the chain. So we're going to allow these movies to happen because you think that you're making this movie as a, you know. To honor these people. To honor these people. But we're basically allowing you to, to show and film. And we're actually giving you the budget for this so that we can really show the true message is that have any of them been successful. Yeah, there's so much I want to say, but I'm trying to be more PC. We're not the only oppressed group on this planet. Okay. At one time, the, you know, at one time, the, the people we call Jewish people could not 
settle anywhere. They were migrating all across the planet and being pushed out of every country, every city. And, you know, they figured out how to mobilize and have their leaders and have their branding changed, stereotypes and all. Yeah, there are still stereotypes against them and everything, but it doesn't hinder them the way it hinders us. It doesn't deter, these stereotypes are not so far at the front of people's mind where when they see someone of Jewish descent, they instantly think of, you know, the horrible things that you saw in like the Nazi cartoons and, 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 and newsreels. You don't instantly think of those things, you know, when someone Jewish is sitting in front of you. But I feel like when someone of color is sitting in front of you and you're either a hiring manager or so, you're thinking of these stereotypes or these potential issues you might have with that person of color because of your thoughts of how people of color behave. I feel like with us, it just, these things come to the forefront of people's mind when they're interacting with us and not much or not as much as with other people who have history of oppression or who have history of being stereotyped and branded negatively. For, for example, there are the Northern Africans versus everywhere else in Africa. Mm-hmm. And a lot of on a lot of occasions, you'll see even our American leaders will have the American flag, the is the the flag for Israel, and the Moroccan flag. Mm-hmm. So there are people of color because I'm sorry, you can't be from Morocco and not be black because that is in, you're in Africa, just North Africa, right? And they don't have the stigmas, you know. They don't have the negative connotation associated with them if you're from Morocco versus from all the other countries in Africa. So they did something just like the Jewish people, you know, they did something to mobilize and change the, change the, 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 the conversation and, 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 the, and, the, and the stereotypes and the view of them. So it can be done. I'm naming two different, you know, cultures of people who have done that, you know, so, and there have been movies that have made that have been made that to to deter them from having strength and courage and, and confidence, mm-hmm. but they didn't deter them. They still figured out how to regain their strength, their culture, and rewrite the narrative for their own, you know, people. Yeah. So it can be done. However, one thing I do notice that they have consistently done, and we've done as well, but. Again, the alphabet game keeps getting to them. They've had their own speaking. There are people who speak for them, leaders, people who drive their their movements or drive their causes, who who rally for them. And we've had this as well. But going back to this, the, the statement I made, I think that that's what we're missing. We're missing a head. You know, the body can't move without the head. The snake needs the head. We need a leader, and that person will then mobilize the people to then be able to move in a certain direction of greatness or or positivity or change. And again, who's gonna sit on that throne? Who's gonna take take on that responsibility as the next leader, the next Fred Hampton, the next Malcolm X, the next Martin Luther King? If we can't prove or don't have a a good track record of making sure these people are protected, Mm -hmm. that you can't, you shouldn't be able to touch them. they shouldn't have been able to touch Fred Hampton because Fred Hampton not only mobilized people of color, but he established the Rainbow Coalition, which means he also mobilized Hispanics and the, I would say, the underprivileged white Southerners, you know? Mm-hmm. So if you're mobilizing all the, and the gangs, excuse yeah. me, I meant the, the gangs. So he had all of these other resources that he mobilized some of them were dangerous people <laughs> and he was still touched that is that's what i mean like but a part of that his one, story too, the closest person to him was also the person against him the closest person to him was also what May the person against that? him was placed in that position oh you mean you mean william o'neill yeah doesn't matter because i feel like there was so many people around him like that should like that really like sh- there should be a way to protect people who matter, you know? And he mattered to so many people, not just people of color. Yeah. But I think a big piece of that too is making sure that 
the system, meaning the community, is not infiltrated, but the system was infiltrated. So mm-hmm. when the bond break, how, and I think a lot of it too plays into, y'all can push it back on me on this too, but a, a lot too of why traditionally Black culture, they're the real low trust factor. Like it's hard for us to trust. And that is based on just a lot of just things and factors and things that, you know, even though it's particular events, but we're always, there's always something against us and we're always heavily guarded. So how do we even build to the point where we can trust our own enough to that we can build? Because I feel like you have to start the foundation in order for us to protect the head. The foundation has to have a solid base and a solid base has to be trust built on trust and a level of united understanding of what the common goal and mission is. And nothing can break that. Yeah, I never really even, I think that's something that's assumed, but that's, that is a huge factor that we do have to consider when you're talking about, even from Sophia's perspective of even mobilizing ahead is that I hear the running joke all the time that everything that Black people, every, no, not even just everything that Black people, but every institution is literally, you can trace it back to, to slavery, right? And so you think about when you had your overseers, but then you even, you had the house Negro and the house slave and the, 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 the like those people, some kind of way, they got sucked into the system, even if it was just a little bit, they got access and then, so their their loyalty was no longer to the black man, the black woman, the black family. Their loyalty was to master, because now they got a little bit of power, just a little bit of power. They got a little bit of access. And so, yeah, I I just didn't even think about it from the standpoint of like because we do have an issue with trusting in general. How do we build a base of being able to trust one another enough to lift someone up and then to make sure that they are being protected once they're in that position to help guide and lead us? I never even thought about that, really. I really had never really thought about that. I think the trusting is also the job of the leader, because even in, even all these names that I've quoted, when Malcolm X, you know, was at his peak, I mean, he had he had all the bickering Muslims under him. I mean, it wasn't like there was all this harmony going on inside the nation. Same thing with Martin Luther King. There was, you know, plenty other freedom fighters and other movements happening. And he had to he, he had to be the one to mobile, excuse me, each of these people had to be the ones to mobilize and to establish the love and the trust that they all had to have for each other. And they basically, I feel like the people who followed them, they then treated each other based on example. They saw that the leader loved them, that the leader saw them as special, that the leader said that they can be, you know, anything they want. So that being instilled in them then made them love each other, embrace each other, because it was something that they saw was genuinely being given to them by whomever that leader was in power. So then it trickled down to the people and then they treated each other as so. That's always what I've noticed. So again, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's learning by watching, you know, and they were watching their leader treat them a certain way. So then they treated each other a certain way. And then the trust became developed because then it became family and that leader became like, like dad. Right. I, I, I agree with you to a, a certain extent. And of course we had our, our own kind of conversation about individual versus collective leader. I still feel individualism plays a big piece of that. And also I feel like kind of pushing a leader to that, we're, we're pushing this person to be the head of this. That's a lot that comes, that's a lot of weight. And also to a point, it kind of feels like we're glorifying one person. That almost makes them like a God. And I don't want to make a person, I don't want to ever put anybody in that, that my personal view, that much power over my life. We have a president. That's what a president does for this whole country. We have one person who's our leader at this time is Biden. We don't look at him as a God, but if we have one person who's a leader of like people of color, I don't think it's a God. It's more like just someone who's setting us straight and helping us find our way and helping us focus. Cause there needs to be someone who keeps us on path, keeps us on. And they, and you listen to that person because that person's putting their life on the line. That person is, you know, out in the forefront. And so just like with the president, that's the reason why we listen to him. That's the reason why when he tells us to go stay in the house, we go stay in the house, you know? That's what I kind of think. 
when we, and I don't think anyone looks at our president as a God, but they're our leader. Yeah, I, 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 I would definitely would give you that. I, I, I agree. Some people really do look to the president as a God. If you look about, if you think about Trump, he, these people literally go tooth and nail and I, and that, and I can see your point there. If we, if, if you think about the extreme of how these people are like these Trump supporters are and how they are pushing him as a leader for them and their movement, they feel if we had something that's similar, I mean, I'm not saying that we are, it, it's not, they're not the same. Like our fight is not the same. I don't even con- consider there is a fight because they're privileged in that way, but that's not another conversation. Um, but I, I get what you're saying there. I still believe like, Maybe that's another reason why we have some of the issues that we have is that that's a that we haven't had been able to get that new force of a leader to to step in because that's such a massive weight and tradition has shown that it doesn't end well for them. And again, it goes back to my statement about individuals. Like as individuals, if we're going to put somebody in that level of position we really have to mobilize ourselves to making sure that we are standing behind that person and pushing them forward for that common goal and agenda. Because if we are weak, if one of us is weak, no matter who the head is, it's going to all crumble. So we got to unite in order to lift is kind of how I feel. Like we still, yeah, we may need a leader, but we can't, we can't, amplify a leader until we can get our sales right too this is true i usually don't play devil's advocate i feel like yana usually plays devil's advocate a lot <laughs> but i'll play devil's advocate just a tiny bit a tiny bit but these are also like my my, my personal opinions and thoughts so i understand once again where sophia is coming from when she's talking about the, uh, the idea of having a leader right i think that that concept and that idea is important and it's needed However, on the other end of that, because I feel like we've seen it here just within our own country the last however many four years with this last administration that we just had, the the people put somebody in position of leadership who shouldn't have been in leadership, but because they came across as having good leadership type qualities, but they weren't fit for the role. And unfortunately, this one individual basically led a whole bunch of people into some foolishness. And it was a lot of innocent people that just became bystanders within the process. So what what I'm saying is, where I understand where Yana's coming from is saying, when you want to make sure you solidify your base in the grassroots level is because at the end of the day, the leader should serve as a servant. You should be a servant leader. You serve the people, right? You're our mouthpiece. You, and so the things that concern us and the things that are important to us, we have to be on the same page at the bottom to say, okay, now we get this message to the leader because he's the perfect person to be able to convey this message. Not the leader having his own ideas and his visions for how he thinks things could go because things could go left real quick. You know what I'm saying? Or he can suddenly, you know what I mean? He could be a great leader to a certain degree and then he gets a hold of this power, this air about himself and he decides to take the movement in a completely different direction. We're like, whoa, 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 whoa. We didn't sign up for this. You know what I'm saying? So we have to be careful also just be like, here, we want him to be a leader. We do need to make sure, yes, if we, we're putting someone in the in that head space that we as, at the bottom and at the base, working our way up, that we are on the same page and that these are the things that are important to us and we want to see happening. And then it's, you know, and then like you said, Sophia, then it all works like a body is supposed to function and work. You know, understand how it's designed to work. So one head, we need one head. That's so important. One person who's willing, sorry, who's knowledgeable enough about the game. Because even though they're a leader and they're trying to in, induce change and, and uplift, they know how they need to know how to play the game. Because that person is going to be the one who's going to be taking our grievances to the White House. Mm -hmm. That person is going to be the one who's going to be trying to mobilize with other entities, like what Mr. Hampton did. Mm -hmm. And as playing the game, not just being out there 
picketing and marching and um, and, and begging for change, someone who's willing to get those meetings in the White House, in, you know, in, in, in other government facilities and speak to people who matter, who can change law, change legislation, who can go in and build youth centers and who can give money, people in, who, can, who can go and make change happen with the business makers, who can play the game on our behalf with our best interest in mind. That's what I mean by the leader. And that leader, yes, their purpose is all supposed to mobilize and keep the spirits and energies up. But more importantly, they need to be the ones who play the game for us and play it well. Because like I said, we're not the only culture or race of people that's been oppressed. I named two others. They they knew how to play the game. They found uh, they found leaders who know how to play the game and everyone followed suit. Right. I totally right. agree. I have a, a, qu- a follow up question to all of that that yes. y'all may be like, hmm? <laughs> <laughs> Does that leader have to look like us? What you talking? Yes. What you talking? I'm just throwing out a question just to change the, change the narrative a little bit and change the game. No, they you absolutely have to take somebody to look not like looking us. like us to be the leader. They have to look like us. They have to have no. They they gotta be one of us. I don't want no Rachel Dolazar leading my <laughs> leading my people. I'm so sorry. That's what you mean. <laughs> she was a part of the NAACP and everything. I'm still Is this what you're talking about? I appreciate y'all. Let me rephrase my question. Let me rephrase my question. <laughs> because I'm not going to hold you. There are, we do have some non-melanated or lighter friends that sometimes carry the movement more than our own. People that look like us. Hmm. Now, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm just throwing this as, a, I'm posing this as a question, but I see the side eye that you're giving me, so Sophia. <laughs> look at us, she's sipping. But you know how sometimes, <laughs> think about ourselves as individuals. We might have a good ally, a real friend. There are some of us that really have people that are that'll fight for us and they utilize their privilege to advantage to move us forward. Mm-hmm. So if we have somebody that is truly, and I mean vetted and truly like for us as a people and moving us forward, like they step to the side and be like, you know what? No. I know my privilege and I know I I know, but yeah. We Y'all need to be where y'all supposed to be. And I'm going to do everything in my power, whether that's my own life. It requires my life. I'm going to throw my life on the line, use my privilege to get y'all there. Will we be accepting of something like that? My, my, love quick, answer, my quick answer, I do too. Because I feel like Sophia, gonna, she going to go for well, it. I'm about to get in. <laughs> <laughs> my little quick response to what you um, just posed. I I think that when we were talking earlier about like having someone to play the play, having a leader that can play the game. I think that person needs to be on the other side of the game, right? They need to stay in the area of the game that we trying to infiltrate and trying to overcome opposed to, you know what I'm saying? So they can say, okay, they can be that listening ear on the other end. When our leader comes to them and say, now this is what's, you know what I'm saying? This is what we, we trying to do. These are the moves we're trying to make. And then you kind of got a gatekeeper, so to speak, to say, let me, you know what I'm saying? Let me have this conversation. I'm gonna go to bat for y'all on the other end. But as far as whoever we would say is helping to push our movement forward and leading us, hell no. I the like like mm-mm. <laughs> for the people, by the people, we the people. We don't need everybody else. Like that's fine. And yes, we appreciate you being an ally and being fully vetted and we trust you and all that stuff and do your job. But do your job and talk to your people. Let us do our job and we're going to come to you and you can gatekeep and say, now I'm going to bust this thing wide open. You feel me? But as far as, you know, all that other stuff, nah. Of course, Sophia gives her, because I know Sophia got a word. That's I all you know. know. Don't shoot the mess. I just wanted to pose this question for a healthy debate. I don't want people coming at me like, oh, you yeah, don't come for Yana. Savior. I just I'm looking for the white savior. Don't wanna... come for Yana, because I'm telling you right now, don't argue. Don't do not come for Yana. This on a cousin level. This family right here. Don't do that. I appreciated the question. Okay? Oh no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead, Sophia. I agree with you because you know what? You made me think of one of my favorite people from history. So, oh, 
back it up. Yes, I, sorry, I do not want Rachel Dolazar to be <laughs> our leader or consideration, but but damn, if God reincarnates another John Brown, then absolutely, because that's the one thing I hate. All these Civil War movies that are made and Civil War TV shows, they always mention Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman, but they never mention the person who literally kicked off the Civil War, like they had to go to war, and who was also shoulder to shoulder with Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman. That was John Brown. John Brown was a white male who was killing in the name of free the Black people. He had his whole family killing in the name of abolishing of slavery. The Hulu show, Good Lord Bird, produced by Ethan Hawke, God bless his soul. He plays the lead character, John Brown. Mm-hmm. I've seen one episode so far. They're, they try to make him look like a kook. They try to make him look like a kook because he was a white man during the time of slavery, literally killing racists and plantation owners and freeing slaves and putting his entire family in danger to abolish slavery. So much so that he like made these threats to Lincoln and everything. Like he put so much pressure on the on Lincoln and his so-called union that they almost had to <laughs> go to go to war, to civil war, to combat this thing called slavery and to to demolish it. And it wasn't Harriet, it wasn't Frederick that put the pressure that needed to be placed on him. It was mainly John because John was murdering white people <laughs> left and right and burning plantations and doing all types of things. So I'm just like, if he is reincarnated for 2020 and somehow the new John Brown surfaces from somewhere, then that's a different story. Then absolutely. Because the conviction that man had just for doing the right thing just for treating people like people is unlike I've, anything I've ever seen in a person who's ever lived. And that is including all of the Black leaders we've had. Like he really took the cake in terms of being a, a, a fighter for humanity and for the fair treatment of people of color. And he was not a person of color. So like I was saying, I've seen... I've seen the first episode and love the show. I actually didn't think he was a kook. I feel like he he did what he had to do. He went hard. He went hard for the cause. And like I said, I still haven't finished. That was just one episode in. I would also like to say that I appreciate the fact that he actually used the Bible for the right reasons. Like he wasn't twisting words. You know what I'm saying? Like he was solid about his cause and why he was doing what he was doing and, and not twisting scripture. The other thing is, I understand exactly what you're saying, Sophia, but I think he was still, he was a leader from the standpoint of, like he was rallying. And and of course, I still haven't finished the series, so I can only speak from the one episode I saw. So correct me, please correct me if I am wrong, because I could very well be speaking wrongly. But from what I got is that the people that he kept rallying up were other white people to say, hey, let's go knock off these other white people and put them in check about this whole slavery situation. So it wasn't so much that he was a leader for Black people, but he was a leader in saying, hey, white people, get y'all stuff together. Y'all know this ain't cool. And let's blow some pants off in the process to make, you know, drastic drastic measures and and drastic change because this is not right. At the end of the day, this is never okay. And so that's kind of what I've gotten from that. Like I said, I still need to finish. I think it's a great show. I had no idea who John Brown was, was very intrigued uh, about his story. Ethan Hawke actually does an ex- exceptional job of playing his character. And like I said, I actually don't, he does not come off as crazy to me. I'm like, I, I, I see why, but that could just be because I'm Black. And oh, so I've only seen one episode. And I've only seen one episode. So but I feel like he goes hard from like yeah, the first all, two minutes. You notice that though. But you notice that though. Whenever someone who is non-Black, who's helping 
black people they always look at as why are you doing this are you crazy you have you have you know a good life and so eventually they start to try to make him seem a little off for his convictions but ah. you're absolutely right he wasn't necessarily a leader of the black he he never he never took that that's the one thing i liked about him he had that level of respect where <laughs> In the show, he refers to Frederick Douglass as the god of the Negroes. <laughs> and, and he he's the one who pleads with Douglass to do more than just have public speeches and stuff to actually, you know, get a gun and fight for his people. He's the one who, who, who gathered together with Harriet Tubman to start planning places to infiltrate. So he never wanted, he never put himself in a situation of, uh, or in a title of being a leader of the black, of the black, black people. Mm -hmm. He basically was just one of the three who literally helped ignite the ignition to start the civil war to end slavery. He was yeah. one, and they never mentioned him. They only really mentioned Douglas and Tubman and, and Turner and Nat Turner. Mm -hmm. And, and I just always think it's so interesting how white America doesn't want to acknowledge one of their own that was such a power player in the jumping off of the civil war. Yeah. So much so that he was murdering his own. So much so that he was like, I, I mean, I don't want to ruin too much of the show for you because I haven't seen it, but in terms of his family, like his wife, his two sons, like they all were in the cause. And not just because, oh, daddy was doing it. No, this was what he instilled in them. Yeah. He, he didn't want them to be like the other people who were living then in terms of having this disdain for people of color and, you know, this, this you know, white supremacist uh, mentality. He instilled these Christian values in them. Yes, but he also instilled in them that, you know, just because he's brown doesn't mean he's less than you. He's your brother, too. And we're going to fight for these people because, you know, God will redeem us. We'll live again. So why not? And it was all about this selflessness of how can I be a person of God? And how can I be a person that is considering myself trying to live a certain life, but I turn the blind eye to this horrific act of evil. It was interesting that this person is so erased from history and he's not brown. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I always feel like they're always jumping to build a statue or a museum or someone, you know, of, from who's European or of European descent. And this person is of European descent, but they gave their life and the life of their family for a cause that is so prolific, but he's not mentioned. Do you think it's a double-edged sword though? Like the, 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 the idea of bringing this, putting this show out, is this a question? Since y'all don't like to pose, because I just want to pose the question. Do you think it's a double-edged sword uh, uh, putting the putting the idea, or not the idea, but bringing this character, this real-life individual, and the story to the forefront, and Black people are like, but all Black people, all Black things, all the Black things right now, we don't need a white savior type of thing. Do you think that's a double-edged sword? Just quick. But that's the thing. He wasn't trying to be a white savior because he was he wanted to die. No, and that's the thing I, I thought was so interesting. Yeah, but no, the I'm double edged not... sword, I get I get what you mean. Yeah, um, I'm from other people's perspective, not from his perspective. I don't think he was uh, was trying to be a white savior. He was truly living out what like, he you, right. if you yeah. Google his story, it's insane. Yeah. Like the, when his first son, son got shot during the when they were I'm not gonna go too far, but he basically was like just shut up and take the bullet. I'm not going to put you out of your misery. You'll be dead in about 12. This is like, that didn't stop him and make him be like, okay, I didn't take care of my kid because this is getting crazy. No, it's like, dude, I got, I got to help these people. This is what's happening to them. It's so wrong. So stop complaining. You'll be dead in a few hours. The bullet will finally kick in and you'll die. <laughs> he just, it was nothing deterring him from his cause of diminishing this level of evil, which was slavery, which was, excuse me, chattel slavery. Yeah. I think the With problem... This, Oh, yeah. Many people don't view that as an evil. You know what I'm saying? Oh, people, there's slaves everywhere. There's, I'm saying other people. They don't recognize the pure evilness of what that institution was. I think it's interesting how people can protest and chain themselves to trees over animals and the way they treat animals in terms of the harsh conditions. But there are people 
being treated in the same type of conditions, even worse. Mm-hmm. And there's nobody chaining themselves to trees and boycotting on their behalf. Mm-hmm. I, you know, again, I'm not, I don't have anything against cows, but <laughs> I think that people and humanity also needs to be fought for. Absolutely. Absolutely. But Absolutely. the double-edged sword mentioned in terms of the show, mm-hmm. I am a strong believer in everything being presented in plain sight. Mm-hmm. Sometimes history is also hidden in plain sight. And I think that with that show, because this man was so unbelievably courage, I mean, courageous, and his behavior was so fantastical in terms of who he, the murders and everything in the name of, you know, freeing slaves. I think that people will look at it and not even be able to believe that this was a real man. Uh-huh. People are going to look at it as, this is crazy. Nobody would do this today. Or this is crazy. This, this is a fabrication. There's no way he could have been like this. So the double-edged sword is, again, showing you truth in plain sight. Because that happens. Sometimes you can be programmed for something yeah. and then someone will give you the truth to help you break your programming so you know about something and you just reject it because it's so against your programming. And I think most people will reject that show because it's so against their programming. Like there would never be someone who's going to be this, you know, aggressive and gun ho for a race and a culture that's not theirs. A word. An entire word. Thank mm-hmm. you for that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's good. Well, thank y'all for joining me in that conversation. Hey. It's over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got to say something for a part two because that, I mean, we talked today. People need to digest this first half and do your research on John Brown because I know, like Terry mentioned, like that I didn't know anything about John Brown either until our initial talk with Sophia. And that goes back to our main point of e programming. And education. Those are two standards. Those are two things that we can do individually today that that helps move the culture forward. Yes. Like we talk about setting our hands in, in action. Not everything is meant for, and I I, I don't want to I want to make sure I address this too. Not everyone is meant to be on the front line. Right. Absolutely. Very true. Yes. But that doesn't mean that you get to sit idle and just right on the coattails of everyone else that is fighting for it, not only for the collective, meaning on your behalf too. So yeah. again, just the deprogramming and the education. And those are two things today that you could take away. And, you know, really, like I said, look up these individuals that, and look them in untraditional ways that are, because again, you're not going to find the information in the traditional spaces half the time, because again, these are things that, they want to bury and keep us from knowing the truth and knowing our true selves, knowing our true stories, and as well as the people that really contributed to the fight and moving forward. So, can I just add to that too? And, and we talked about accountability, and we talked about accountability like on a grand scale, but even just to add to your deprogramming and education, holding yourself accountable enough to know that something is it not is off, but so much holding yourself accountable to the point where you say, okay, this is a gray area in my life or here's a hole in my my life or my views and my perspective. And now I need to shift and deprogram. Do you get what I'm saying? Like you, there has to be accountability for you to even say something in me needs to change. I need to deprogram. Does that make sense? Yes. (laughs) Yes. So I just wanted to add that back in there with that, but I know, yes, deprogramming, and education are 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 key. Absolutely. All Sorry. right. Any other final words before we officially close out? We need to choose a leader. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any nominations send us those so we can get a formal vote together? Because we <laughs> no, I'm joking, but I agree. But the how is a big part of that the how the who the how and the who yeah. man or why huh man or woman 
you know what? We just need to figure out how to get our other Panthers back out of exile. And maybe they could just step into, you know, Angela Davis is still breathing. She's just in Cuba in exile. And Cuba is holding her down because America will not, they cannot get her. Cuba will not extradite Gail. Oh, and then, I mean, Stokely, I think he, he, he went to Algeria. You know, these yeah, are all Panthers who are still breathing, who could be leaders, but, you know, they're in exile. So we can figure out a way where they can come back and not be arrested. <laughs> I'm sure they'll step right into Fred Hampton's uh, shoes. Yeah. They all knew him. You met, you met Asada Shakur? 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 Yeah. Asada. I don't know where she is, though. <laughs> she's she's, she's, she's the one that's out in Cuba. Angela's still rocking around. The oh, my bad. Sorry. Angela's in America. <laughs> yeah. The what? The, she had an exile? No, Angela's not. Asada Shakur. Shik- I can't get a last name yeah. right. Shana Shakur, yeah. yeah. She's the one in exile. Oh, you're absolutely right. Yes, because they, because I think, please, I uh, might not be correct on this, but I think the last president to try to get Cuba to, to, to extradite her was Trump. I think you're actually correct on that. Yeah, they're still after this woman. <laughs> So, but yeah, man or woman, I don't think it'll matter. Stokely it, Carmichael, Afina Shakur, Angela, I don't know, because she's in America and she has every opportunity. If she ain't in exile, I don't know what she's doing. <laughs> no offense, Angela, because you, I respect and love you, but I just feel like we, we need someone who, you know, not friend, not too friendly right now with with right. with the government and yeah. with, 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 with celebrity and with Hollywood and stuff. Someone who's truly for the people. Yeah. Not not taking anything from her in any capacity, though. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. Agreed. And just to say this, maybe this would be a teaser for our next conversation. I don't know. But we also need to band together and unite, not just within the states, but internationally. Like, the common goal is for the uprising of our people. And that is not bounded to the states. Like, I feel like our true mission, yeah, how we uplift each other, is when we get united internationally. Our oh. brothers and sisters in Africa and in European countries, in Asian countries, like when that force rises. Yeah, like Marquise Garvey tried to accomplish. Mm-hmm. So, on that note, you guys. We hope you enjoyed this conversation today when us talking and chatting things. I hope you continue to chill with us and learn, observe. Like, again, these are our views, our interpretations, but also conversations that we need to have. These are, I don't know, maybe should we, can we name this series our conversation starters? I don't know, because these are conversations that we need to start having. But until next time, melanate on that. Thank you for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed our chat today. Keep the conversation going by heading to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leaving us a review. Have a story of your own to share? Email us at info at melanatedconversations.com or connect with us on social media at Melanated Conversations. Till next time, keep raising your voice.